Today we're looking at different kinds of patterns in factoring. We have the difference of two squares. And then we're uh, focusing here on this section where we have the sum and the difference of perfect cubes. We'll do some examples here. And then there's another pattern called factoring by grouping. So we'll do those three types represented here on this page. Let's go ahead and start off with this one. So we have something squared minus something squared, right? So it's written as an A squared, meaning this is a term that is a perfect square, and this is a term that's a perfect square. And when you have that subtraction sign, you'll factor it in this, in this way, where the base becomes the factors that you see in the front, and the base of B becomes the factors that you see in the back. So let's do a couple of examples of these, which actually are on the very bottom of this page here. So let's, uh, let's do number 13 here as an example. So we have x to the fourth minus 36. So the trick is you want to set this up as matching that pattern. You want something squared minus something squared. So can you rewrite x to the fourth as something squared? We can do that with an x squared. Remember, when you have a power to a power, you multiply those, so 2 times 2 is 4. This will be 6 squared is the 36, right? So when you factor this into the pattern, you want the x squared, that's the first term, that will go in front. One gets the positive, one gets the minus, and then the base of 6 goes in the back. And then you check to see if you have more factors possible. x squared is a perfect square, but 6 is not, so that would not factor any further. So compare that with number 14. I have a perfect square and another perfect square. So again, you can think of it as fitting this pattern of something squared minus something squared. So we want a c squared in front and a 9 in the back. So as we set this up with a factoring pattern, c squared plus 9 and c squared minus 9 are the two patterns. So notice now that this is the same difference of perfect squares. So we're going to keep on factoring. So always check to see if your factors can be factored even further. Matching the pattern, c is in front and 3 is in back because 3 times 3, well, 3 times negative 3 will give you that negative 9 that you see there. And there you go. So that's this pattern here. So notice that you have to have the minus sign in order for this to work. If you happen to have a squared plus b squared, that does not factor. So that would be a prime expression. Primes are values that cannot factor or expressions that cannot factor. Now contrast that with these two. If we have perfect cubes, it works whether you have a plus sign or a minus sign. It doesn't really matter. This is something we could not factor with a guess and a check. We really need to memorize this pattern so we know how to set it up. Whatever the base is, that will go here and here and here for the value of A. And whatever the base is for the B, that will go here and here and here. Notice we have a minus sign in that trinomial. And if you have the a cubed minus b cubed, the minus sign is repositioned here in the binomials. That's the only difference. So let's look at a few of these here. Those will be the examples you see at the top. So let's factor the sum or difference of cubes. So let's start off here with number one. So again, the idea is you want to set this up as a pattern of something cubed plus something cubed. So we know we'll have an x in front, and this should be a five. Five cubed gives the 125. So in the pattern, wherever you see the letter A, you'll put the X, and where you see the letter B, you'll put the 5. So it looks like this. We have an A plus B. So first term plus last term, X plus 5. That's going to be multiplied with, so first time squared, first term squared, so X squared, then a minus. Then you multiply together the first and the last term. So multiply the X with the 5, but we want the 5 in front. Put the coefficient in front. And then we'll add to that the last term squared. So 5 squared is 25. And that, that's, that's our pattern. So let's look at a few other variations. Jump over to numbers 3. Okay, so here, again, I see this power of 3. So that gives me a clue that this is a perfect cube. Do you recognize 27 as a perfect cube? It is. Do you recognize 64 as a perfect cube? So again, the idea is we want to set this up as something cubed minus something cubed. So it turns out that you want 4. 4 cubed is the 64, and you want the n there as well. 27 can be rewritten as 3 cubed. 
So in this pattern, wherever you see the A represented, we'll put the 4N in its place. And wherever you see the B represented, we'll put the 3 in its place. So we have this as our factoring pattern. So first term, 4N, minus the last term, 3, minus 3. That's going to be multiplied with... Now we have to square the first term, so I'm just writing it as 4n quantity squared, and I'll simplify that on the next line, plus first term times last term. So 4n is going to be multiplied with the 3, and then plus last term squared. So the last term is 3, so 3 squared. So let's simplify that trinomial. So we have the 4n minus 3 in front. Here we have a 16n squared. Here we have a positive 12n and finally a positive 9. And that's the final form. Uh, I'm just checking, do I have my minus sign in the right place? Yeah, so we should be good there because the minus sign is on the binomial and you see that right there. Now let's take a look at some that appear to not fit the pattern but they can still be factored just the same. So look at number five as an example. So here, again, I see the w to the power of 3. So I'm thinking this might be my pattern of the sum of perfect cubes. But if I look at the coefficient of 2, that is not a perfect cube. And it turns out that 54 is not a perfect cube either. So it's not quite ready for this pattern. What we want to do is remove a common factor. So I'm going to divide out this factor of 2. And now we do have something that fits the pattern of something cubed plus something cubed. We can do that. So don't lose track of that factor of 2. That's going to sit out front here for a while. We want to think of this as something cubed plus something cubed. So that'll be a w and a 3. So we'll apply the w and the 3 to the pattern that we see up here. All right. There's the factor of 2 in front. Then we have the factor of a plus b, so w plus 3. Then we have the factor of the first term squared. Then we have the minus sign. Then we have the first term times the last term, so 3w. And then finally, adding last term squared, so 3 squared is 9. So notice you have a total of three factors, one in front, here the binomial in the middle, and the trinomial at the end. So let's see that one more time here with number 6. Here we have v cubed. So I'm thinking, hey, that's a perfect cube, but 40 is not. So again, we have to remove a common factor. This ends in a 0, 625 ends in a 5. I'm thinking they're both divisible by 5. So let's try to factor out a 5 here, and we get 8v cubed minus 125. And that looks better. I recognize 8 as a perfect cube, and I recognize 125 as a perfect cube. So let me set this up as something cubed minus something cubed. So replace that 8 with a 2. 2 cubed is 8. We need a v right there as well. Replace that 125 as a 5 cubed. So we'll use the 2v and the 5 in our factoring pattern. So we still have the factor of 5 in the front. We have 2v minus the 5 as the middle factor. And at the end we have the first term squared, so 2v squared, then a plus sign, then a 2v times the 5, and I'm just running out of room, so the last term will be the last term squared, so 5 squared. So now let me simplify that trinomial. So 5 times 2v minus 5, and that is being multiplied by 4v squared plus 10v plus 25. So the third and final pattern that we're looking at are really the sequence of steps that we call factoring by grouping, and that's not represented as any of the patterns up top. We're just going to go right to the examples and look at a couple of these in this middle section here. So with factoring by grouping, we're going to pair up the first two terms, pair up the last two terms, and then remove the common factor from each pair. So we have an r cubed minus 3r squared. We could factor out an r squared. One way to think about this is multiply it back in to figure out what you need to get that original problem. So r squared times what would get me an answer of r cubed. So we need r to the power of 1. r squared times what would give me an answer of negative 3 r squared. So that's one way you can think about it, or you can divide it out. So r cubed 
divided by r squared is what? I know I need an r. Negative 3 r squared divided by the r squared gives me an answer of negative 3. I like to think of multiplying it back in myself. Here we have a positive 6r minus 18. We have a common factor of 3, but that's, that's too small. We can go bigger. We want the biggest possible common factor, right? So let's remove a common factor of 6. So include the sign with the 6. So 6 times what gives me the 6r, and 6 times what gives me the negative 18. And this is your check step. These binomials have to be the same. If they're not the same, that means that we fa we factored out the wrong value, whether it's a different sign or it needs to be a bigger number. That's your check step. And because they are identical, we're now going to factor out the common binomial. So out of the first half of the problem, factor out the r minus 3. And you ask yourself, what's left over? The r squared. And then on the back half of the problem, you factor out the r minus 3. You ask yourself, what's left over? You have the positive 6. So you have a binomial times a binomial. And you check to see if either of those can be factored any further. And they don't in this case, and that's your answer. So again, you can check yourself by foiling it. If you multiply the first terms, you get r cubed. If you multiply the outside terms, you get 6r. There it is. If you multiply the inside terms, you have a negative 3r squared. There's that result. And if you multiply the last times the last, you get negative 18, and there's that term. So you can FOIL to check to see if you get the original problem. So let's look at a couple variations on this. Take a look at number 9, and then we'll do number 11 next. So here on number 9, we have our four terms. Grouping up the first half, grouping up the last half. I'll remove a common factor of c squared. That leaves me with c plus 4. Here on the back half, notice that both terms have a negative sign. So in addition to a value, we also want the sign. So we're going to factor out a negative with the 9. So negative 9 times what gives me a negative 9c? Negative 9 times what gives me a negative 36? That's a positive 4. So again, this is your check step. Make sure that those binomials are the same, and they are. So let's remove the common binomial of c plus 4. c plus 4, and what's left over? We divide out the c plus 4 in front, we are left with the c squared. Divide out the c plus 4 in back, and you're left with the minus 9. And that's it. Not quite. Actually, we have the difference of perfect squares. So we can keep on going by factoring that into c plus 3 and c minus 3. So we, in fact, get a total of three factors. Finally, let's look at problem number 11. Here's my first two terms. Here's my last two terms. This one has an especial um, sort of a sticky point right here that a lot of students kind of overlook. It's easy to make a mistake on, so take a look at this second half when we get to that factory. Out of the first two terms, we can factor out a 25 as well as a p squared. So 25p squared on the outside. Let's multiply it back in. 25p squared times what gives me that 25p cubed? I need p to the power of 1. 25p squared times what gives me a negative 25p squared? I need a minus 1. Okay? So now, as I look at the third and the fourth terms, you look at that and you might say, well, there is no common factor. There is no coefficient. There is no variable to factor out. What do we do now? Again, our goal is for these binomials to look the same, and they differ by a sign. So what we want to do is factor out a negative 1, and that will force the sign to change. So negative 1 times what gets you a negative p? Negative 1 times what gets you a positive 1? Now the binomials look the same. And the, the tricky part here is recognizing that we need to factor out a negative 1 just to make the signs change, but also recognizing that that's kind of a placeholder, right? We don't often write a 1 right there, uh, because usually if you're multiplying with a 1, whether it's positive or negative, we just kind of leave out the 1 and maybe just use the minus sign. But put the 1 there, because we need that as a placeholder for our next step. We're going to remove the common binomial of p minus 1. So what's left over? You have a 25p squared in front. And what do you have in back? You have that minus 1. So if you don't write down that minus 1, this tends to show up as blank, and then, and then students don't realize that you have to have a number here. So that's our placeholder. One more step. This is actually the difference of perfect squares, so let's factor one more time. That 
factors into 5p plus 1 and 5p minus 1.